Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another in the BCT Conservation Webinar Series. I'm here in this pretty flashy studio setup on Darug Country in Parramatta, and today we're talking all things conservation grazing. Mm. As always, I am Joel Stibbard, ecologist in the education team here at the Biodiversity Conservation Trust, or the BCT. In my role, I have the pleasure of informing landholders and the public of the values of private land conservation and help build a conservation community within which we can all learn new ways to understand and protect our natural world. And today's webinar provides a means for us to do just that. So thanks for joining us. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we're all meeting today, recognising their ongoing connection to land, waters and culture. I'm on Darug country, as mentioned, and I know we have people calling in from right across New South Wales and possibly even further afield. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and I extend that to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people with us today. And look, today's webinar is a contentious one, let's be honest. On one hand, livestock grazing has been responsible for immeasurable damage to Australian ecosystems, particularly the grassy woodlands and grasslands of what has become known as the sheep wheat belt of New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. And in many instances, livestock grazing practices continue to threaten remnant patches of native veg and suppress ecosystem recovery. However, regenerative agriculture is gaining momentum and strategic cross grazing or pulse grazing, call it what you will, is being used to assist with weed and biomass control and to stimulate ecosystem renewal, particularly when traditional practices such as the use of fire are difficult to implement. So today, we're going to cut through it. We're going to cut through that speculation. And we're going to give you the BCT's take on conservation grazing and show you how BCT landholders and graziers are implementing our conservation grazing guidelines to bring about positive biodiversity outcomes. And to do this, we're going to provide a case study of sorts of one conservation agreement that implements a grazing regime. We are therefore very, very grateful to have conservation landholders Cole and Bev Hamilton call in from our Dubbo office. And we also have regional BCT officer Glenn Walker and ecologist Thomas Munro, who have been working with the Hamilton family to implement their conservation grazing plan near Narromine. How are we all going today? Good. Yeah, we're good. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah, so look, we're happy to get in the weeds on this one, people. I'm happy to play devil's advocate a little bit. Um, I'll be asking some questions. I'm sure many of you have, and you'll have an opportunity to do so yourself via the Slido function. I've got it all here, people. But please keep it on topic. Anything off topic or that we can't get to in the hour, we can provide comment on in a follow-up email. But before we get into it, I wanted to show you guys a video of the Hamilton's place. They were lovely enough to let us um, come onto their property and, and film for a bit. So you can get a feel for what's happening on the ground, given we're all sitting there in the office, and give you a bit of a con some context on the discussion. So have a look, and we'll see you on the other side. My early childhood, it was all uncleared, uncultivated, and I spent the early part of my childhood helping my father and uncle clear part of the property for cropping. But the stocking side of things, it was set stock, each paddock had its one mob and they'd stay there and that's where they belonged and it was set stocked. In the late 2000s, we peaked an interest for uh, soil biology and it made us question what we're actually doing to our farm and then to ourselves through application of high rates of chemicals and fertilizers for the, the cropping program and it's where we first came across this concept of uh, high intensity rotational grazing stock are moved from one area to another only there for a few days um, high impact and then long rest and recovery periods before they come back again. So we'd already sort of ventured down that track I suppose for a number of years before we entered into our agreement with the BCT. That there's a, a roadshow workshops around that the team were coming to our area and we went to a, an information session in Trangy. The cut-off date for expressions of interest was pretty close so it was like you really had to come home and make a decision, you know, do we want to even go any further with this or...? The original figures that were talked about at the roadshow were thought, well, why would you bother? And so we worked out a, 
a figure based on a lease, what leasing agreement would be at this time, and we sort of thought, well, we can still graze strategically, so we've sort of gone halfway. It wasn't a full lease rate, it's about half of what the lease rate would be. I think the, the level that we're at, I probably wouldn't have come under that, but it's, I suppose, taking up the slack for the, the grazing that we're not getting out of there that we might have otherwise done. And, but on top of that, I think the plus will be in a dry period where we can't graze it because we haven't had the regrowth and we're still getting that um, financial reward off there for not grazing it. Yeah. I suppose it's a regular income, it's finding out the, the peaks and troughs of the, the climate variability that, that comes through in your bottom line. Well, I'm very pleased with the, the number of yeah, recruits of various uh, species there. There's some wattle that hasn't been there since I was a child and um, lots of uh, young wilga that, and uh, some of the cypress that are re-establishing coming back in that, that area. Normally when it was set stock they, they never got a chance. Our natural areas, if you like, the, or what's left of them, they need to be preserved. Um, otherwise, in another you know, 50 years' time, there'll be nothing left. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for us, it wasn't such a big um, step outside our mindset. You know, for someone that yeah. has <coughs> area on their place that aren't in the space that we were already in, it yeah. possibly could be much more difficult. I think for an outsider that's not where we were, that or possibly their fear is that it's just a, a lock it up type scenario, but we still get to graze it um, strategically. and um, So it's a win-win both ways, I'd say. But, uh, we still get to use it in the right way. Yeah, and the environment gets a plus out of it too. Well, there you have it, people a snapshot of a Hamilton's property and a glimpse into their mindset around, you know, considering whether or not to enter an agreement with us at the BCT. It is a big decision to make. And before we go any further, it's worthwhile mentioning the different agreement types. So we'll do a little bit of a background on our agreement types, what we offer at the BCT and how they're relevant for today's discussion. So as you can see here, we have four different types of agreements. Now, I won't go into detail on them. Suffice to say that there's lots of information already available on our website bct.nsw.gov.au. <laughs> but the one applicable to most of our grazing agreements is that third one, the funded conservation agreement. This agreement type targets specific areas of high biodiversity value. So you're endangering communities and koala habitat, and particularly in highly clear landscapes in that sort of wheat sheep belt, sheep wheat. Which one is it? Through what we call our tender or a fixed price offer mechanisms. Importantly, these agreements provide management funding to landholders to not only implement the management actions, but also provide a source of income for landholders who rely upon the land for living, to make a living. So we simply wouldn't be able to incentivise many landholders in those agricultural landscapes to establish agreements without conservation you know, paying its way a bit. For the Hamiltons, it was the Central West Rivers tender that ran in November 2019 targeting the areas you can see on the map northwest of Dubbo. The workshop that was mentioned in the video that Cole mentioned in Trangy, and you can see Narromine there on that southern edge of the tender area. And importantly, our funded agreements aren't simply left to their own devices. No, no, no. We develop management plans and monitoring regimes, and management is guided by the multitude of guidelines that we have developed, which includes conservation grazing guidelines. So before we talk to Colin Bev, I promise we'll get to our esteemed guests, but I would like to introduce Thomas Munro, the ecologist in the Central West, who is going to give us a bit of an insight into the conservation grazing guidelines and what is required from our grazing landholders. So how are you going, Thomas? Very well, thanks, mate. How are you? Yeah, good, mate. Good. Thanks so much for being here and um, take us through it a little bit if you can. Sure. So... Um... The approach to conservation grazing uh, with the BCT is um, very much based on these uh, grazing principles you've got in front of you here. Um, I'll ba basically break them down. I think they really fall into three kind of major buckets or major major things that we we look at on an ecological um, perspective that I look at um, with my role. Um, so the first the first thing is site context. So um, Grazing isn't 
um, suitable everywhere. Um, very important to have that very clear straight off the bat. Um, it's it's not like we um, allow or even consider grazing to be a suitable um, you know method of of management um, of any sort or allowed at all. Um, in in every site across New South Wales, as we know, we've got agreements from you know Wentworth all the way up to um, Byron Bay. So you can imagine how different the landscapes are across those across those areas, and how how um, grazing may impact those kind of ecosystems differently. Um, so I'd say community type. Um, so that's the vegetation community type, whether it's a grassy ecosystem um, all the way to an, an uh, alpine grassland to a um, semi-arid shrubby woodland um, and everything in between. Um, we, we assess um, primarily first port of call is, is what, kind of, what kind of ecosystem we're talking about here. Uh, and generally we, are, we only allow grazing on grassy ecosystems. Um, we look at vegetation condition. Um, so what what does it actually look like if it's something that's been set stock and hard grazed for 30 years compared to uh, something like at Colin Bev's place that they have been uh, grazing um, strategically with a mind for conservation um, previously where we still have very healthy, good ground cover and ecologically it's quite a quite rich um, species diversity and species richness and ground cover and structure. Um, also, uh, I touched on grazing history with that. What's been the grazing history on the property? What species been grazing the property? Have we had have we had cattle? Have we had sheep? Um, some differing impacts from between species, uh, domestic species, but as well, what's the total grazing pressure too? So, um, you know, depending on which which part of the state you're in, it Maybe maybe goats may be a, a um, big pressure, and it may be kangaroos, and that obviously changes seasonality is a massive part of that as well. So that's the first thing we look at. Uh, secondly, what are the management goals of the um, of the property? Um, reiterating that we do approach grazing as a management tool. Grazing isn't uh, viewed as anything but that in reality, in the way that we implement it on the property. So um, are we targeting um, suppression of an undesirable vegetation type? So usually weeds um, that are palatable stock. Um, managing biomass, um, that's been something that has has come up re recently uh, with, the, um, with the changing over of the floods, um, so much biomass coming up in a lot of areas um, that have been flood affected with, you know, two years of pretty solid rainfall. You could imagine the grass is going pretty gangbusters. Um, so that's an aspect we look at um, and we and we delineate through management zones uh, uh, what we're trying to do. If we've, if we've got um, specific regeneration goals of, of certain species, um, et cetera. And then finally, that's all put into the context of ad adaptive management, which is which is the way that we approach every aspect of our agreements. So um, that may be um, uh, starting a rest period. So a lot of agreements, if um, the condition is uh, suboptimal, probably not what, where we'd want it to be, and we're really focusing on rebuilding the um, the condition of the vegetation on a, on a potential conservation area, we would be uh, doing things like uh, putting a five-year rest period in prior to um, the application of grazing as a management tool. That's quite common. Um, but then, uh, you know, on Colin Bev's place, where from the get-go it was very, in very good condition, that, that wasn't required. Um, and monitoring is another big part of that. So, so we, uh, I think we'll touch on it a little later, but we, we do have consistent monitoring both from the landholder and from the BCT, including um, total grazing pressure monitoring, um, tracking of the application of, of stock into a conservation agreement, and as well tracking the um, species richness and diversity community structure and all of the um, ecological aspects of that um, conservation area. So they're, they're the main pillars. Um, 
by which these principles generally fall into, um, and that's what we what we have in our mind when we're when we're coming to the table initially, looking at developing a management plan for a conservation agreement. Great, mate. Thank you. And I can see that that uh, tenth point there being you know vegetation being regularly monitored against the healthy condition threshold. Um, interested to know when you see uh, what what sort of healthy condition means for. Um, yeah, how do we determine the healthy condition um, at a particular site? Sure. So um, as you can see on the slide here, um, we do have uh, varying, uh, um, you know, uh, guidance around what we would consider healthy condition for uh, what kind of, what area we're in, what's, what Iber region, um, what community type, all the rest of it. You can see it there. Um, and as well, rainfall is a big um, plays a big part into that, so that that would that would give us our starting point of um, on this property. What is going to be our basic framework of what um, healthy condition looks like, and then we translate that through to um, using the um, ground cover and average bulk um, grass sward height measurements, which the landholders um, undertake before they. Um, put their stock onto a conservation agreement and that's all, um, uh, you know, um, captured in their, um, in their grazing management, um, you know, uh, methods that they used. So they, they, they track what that was when they put the, put the stock in there, um, what it is during the stay of the stock. And then when they take them out, make, making sure that they're, um, not dropping below those, um, you know, benchmarks. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, it is it is variable, but that's the that's the strength and the beauty in the system. Really, is we we do not have a one one size fits all, um, as that's just not the reality of um, you know a biological system. So uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's pretty much how we do it there. But you can see the. Um, specific techniques that we use there and we um we educate our landholders on how to how to go about these give them a little one meter quadrat there and a great um and a swad height ruler um so we we do help out the landholder with with being able to make those assessments and they do um record all of that great thanks mate and the other thing to um to talk about i think is the uh is the grazing window um and I've got an example up on the on the screen there on the slide. Um, something I'm, I find really interesting um, in the whole, you know, determining that grazing regime is the idea of the grazing window. Can you give us a bit of a background on sort of how that's determined and why? Sure. Yeah, sure. So um, the things that we we uh, bring into consideration when we're looking when is the best time to graze. Um, first of all, going back to those initial pillars of what, what the purpose is and it's for it's for management. So we look at um, are there, um, where are the uh, species that we're looking to impact, the undesirable species, the weed species, the exotic species that we are, we are actually aiming on uh, controlling through the application of um, grazing as a management action, that's our first port of call. Um, from there, we would then look at um, what other species are occurring on the property. So uh, we can see in our example there, we've got um, some grass species. Um, you know, if we've found uh, uh, other lily species or orchids or any, you know, herbaceous species that may be uh, palatable to stock and have a have a risk of uh, being you know quite adversely impacted by grazing then we take that into account of okay well we're obviously not wanting to um, get the stock coming in and hitting those species uh, when they're going through recruitment phases um, because the the whole idea of what we're doing is we're, is we're trying to protect that allow those species to um, recruit and and get a get a foothold back in systems that they are not in, and as well um, species that aren't in those systems to come back to um, migrate from you know other reserves nearby those kind of things. So that's pretty much what we look at when we're looking at this. Um, 
and it's based around those um, those reproduction um, timings of those species, and you can see there that we've 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 got that example with the list of okay, well we don't want to we don't want to be in, in 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 these months because that's going to potentially have a um, you know a quite a heavy impact on the on on the seeding dispersal and establishment of those other species. So we'll we'll limit limit the grazing um, to to times when when that that isn't going to be taking out the entirety of that reproduction um, window for those species. Yeah, great. Thanks, mate. I'm going to preempt. I've already got a question on such um, on Slido asking when what happens if the grazing window um, overlaps or sorry, the when the weeds and native species flower and set seed at the same time. Do, is that something that regularly occurs? Is something we, um, how do we handle that? Yeah, sure. Well, um, uh, as, as you can imagine, there's, there's a lot of species out there and they've all got their own idea of when it's a good time to reproduce. So um, unfortunately, they, they don't really fit that, that block completely <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Um, and that's when we look at other methods to control those weeds. Um, and those undesired species. So we'd be we'd be looking at other other aspects of weed control. Pretty much all of our um, agreements will have some um, other aspect. Um, we've got our uh, required management actions that are across all uh, conservation areas. And so we'd be looking at well, um, is grazing suitable, um, and do we have other options that we can effectively manage those species. Um, it wouldn't be a case of, oh, well, we need to get rid of these weeds. I guess there goes the orchids. That's not how we'd approach it. Yep. Okay. That's great. It's great to know. And I think it's important to point out. Uh, look, one, I think one more thing from you, Thomas, but given you are our, one of our monitoring um, ecos and you're involved actually with Colin Bev, I can see you there pointing out something in that photo. Probably um, something very interesting. I'd yeah, say. yeah. But that fantastic mustache of yours, I have to mention, it's, it's very good. <laughs> I, could, I wish I could grow one like that. I really do. Um, yeah. So, you know, in regards to monitoring, you're obviously involved in it yourself. Um, there's some landholder monitoring. Just quickly, we've got to get to Colin Bev, but, um, you know, tell us a little bit about the monitoring, you know, as part of a grazing regime. Yeah, sure. So um, across all of our uh, funded conservation agreements and across every conservation agreement rather, but more so in our funded agreements, we have our ecological monitoring module program, which is where we do um, full floristic monitoring, structural monitoring at various monitoring sites across a conservation agreement. So we look at species richness, species diversity, ground cover, um, all manner of um, habitat structure um, and other things like uh, soil and erosion um, and pretty pretty much anything we can think of that'll that'll have an impact um, or indicate um, the the health and the uh, potential gain in biodiversity of that site. So that's one aspect of our of our monitoring uh, that does overlap with grazing. By if if grazing is going on and we see a decline in species, well then we adapt our management. Um, and if we think that that's due to grazing, then we might look at that. Um, but specifically for grazing, we also do um, grazing exclusion plots. So um, unfortunately, I couldn't get a get a picture in that slide there. Um, but we we set up. Um, an array of uh, grazing monitoring sites across um, conservation agreements that have grazing as um, part of the management and um, and that's uh, total grazing pressure proof so we've got um, nothing can get in there we can't rabbits can't get in there um, and we we use that as a tool to uh, determine what impact grazing is having and that's from a total grazing pressure standpoint. And then we can tease out from that with um, the information that's collected by the landholders and the information that we gain through our annual uh, site visits that we uh, go out and um, check out the site. Um, is grazing having a negative impact? Are we dipping below those um, those numbers that we want as far as coverage and as far as species? Um, and so this is ongoing and we we adapt um, that's that's the name of the game, and um, we we utilise all those monitoring techniques there, um, and work with the landholder to see see what we can do, and if we need to um, 
introduce some new management measures or modify existing management measures, if grazing is one of those, then um, then we look at that at that time. Great. And that, yeah, I think that's super important to talk about that sort of link between monitoring and, and adaptive management. Um, so thanks so much, Thomas. Thanks for taking that time to talk us through the guidelines and sort of how they're applied at Colin Bevs. And look, it's almost been half an hour and we haven't even introduced our esteemed guests, Colin Bev, or given them an opportunity. And I know they've, they've traveled to Dubbo, to our Dubbo office to talk to us. Um, I think we've got two or three of them almost in the same room there in Dubbo. So look, I thank you so much for taking the time. I've got a, um, a map that I've actually t- taken from the, uh, agreement from the management plan that shows your agreement area, which I think is um, really interesting in in that it doesn't, and you, you can talk to us please about this, but it doesn't take up all of your property. It's just a proportion, 160 odd hectares or so. And this map uh, provides, you know, a, an indication of where those different management zones that uh, Thomas mentions uh, actually exist. So please, can you take some time, talk us through, you know, how you've applied grazing um, the grazing guidelines, what these management zones are all about, and just give us a bit of, uh, yeah, a background on your experience with us here at the BCT, please. That must be me. Yeah, go, Colin. Uh, good Thanks, afternoon, mate. and welcome to the uh, Zoom call. <laughs> um, yeah, um, our experience with the BCT so far, um, it's certainly improved in the last probably 18 months since Thomas has been our full-time uh, Enviro guru. Um, before that, and I'm not sure whether it was uh, possibly staffing issues internally, that uh, some of the communications were quite slow and we felt like we were left out on our own to a degree in the first little while. But And then there was uh, we had a, a couple of or a, um, ecologists assigned to us, but then that person got transferred to another area. So mm. fingers crossed, Thomas will be with us now for uh, help us or guide us with anything that we need to. But um, the management zones that you see there, um, that was how we had that section of the property already um, split with internal uh, temporary fencing for grazing management, uh, not probably if it was done according to either soil type or, or species um, location. It may be in different shapes, but um, the area to the, uh, I guess, the, the south or the eastern end of that is, is tends to be more open woodland country. Uh, it runs into more acacia or mile and, and open grasslands, whereas the other areas, to, um, the, the larger area there, um, the blue area is predominantly uh, cypress and what I'll call yellow box. Um, and then the other areas are probably a mixture of all, all three there. Um, but, yeah, that's why it's been split up in those zones is purely for management of livestock so we can get the uh, the impact that we want and, the, um, uh, yeah, just the, the, the time periods that we allocate to each area. Okay, great. Thanks, Cole. So do you, do you actually graze, do you graze that area? Is that area sort of treated differently to the way you manage the rest of your property and, and how, I guess, you've managed things prior to the agreement itself? It, it is managed differently now in that we're are probably more careful of making sure that we have enough, uh, not so much ground cover there, but enough um, material there that's worth grazing to start with, but also we've got to fit within the guidelines of our agreement. But um, we're probably a little bit more conscious of the the species that are there now compared to the rest of our farm. But having said that, though, um, we are getting recruitment of other species um, on the rest of the property just through the change of management compared to beforehand when it was all set stocked. So... You know, we're, we're probably going to get a big, better re- recruitment in this um, conservation area than on the rest of the farm. Okay, great. Thank you. And I've just got an image up on the screen here of um, that was taken during the recent film filming, and that's obviously in the agreement area itself. Um, again, I'm going to just ask the question around, you know, from, from the outside looking in, it does look like it's a little bit, it can look a bit uh, bare um, on the ground there. Is that something that, do you find it hard to manage 
uh, grazing to that healthy condition threshold that Thomas talks about earlier? Is it something that you, you find affects, you know, the way you manage the property or that area? Um, no, in, once you've got the, or I find anyway, with the, the, if you've got high density stocking rates in there, they're not all folk, you know, picking and choosing on the, on either the open area or the wooded area that they're, they're just crash grows the, the, the total area and then they're out of there and the whole area gets the, gets a graze and, and then gets a, a recovery period as well. So I, you know, unless I'm specifically focusing on either the open area, well, that's the bit that I'll be watching when I know it's time that they've, they've been in there long enough to, to move on to the next area. Okay, great. Thanks, mate. Here's a, yeah, I've got another image here, which I think um, better represents what's found on the ground. It's actually looking, looking quite good. Is, is this area, just, just out of interest, is this area, um, where are we in the, in the agreement? Is this, and where are we up to with the regime? This was obviously taken only a couple of weeks ago. Um, so is this sort of post-graze or um, where are yeah. we up to with the regime there? Um, that's really about three, four weeks after a, a graze. And I probably should add that um, in the short time that we've been, had this agreement, um, that's, that was our first graze. Uh, because when we first went into the agreement, it was right at the very end of the, the drought and it was pretty harsh conditions then, um, not only from uh, the grazing, but the, the root pressure that was there in that area at the time. Um, it was really challenging our, manu our grazing strategy in that we had roos from all, all the neighbouring farms around um, hosted on our place because... The surrounding areas were bare, totally bare from either overgrazing or cultivated from for cropping, and so it was hard to to try and preserve um, grasslands for our stock when we're feeding everybody else's kangaroos at the same time. But so we haven't we haven't had the opportunity to, to graze until just recently. Um, we would have done it before then, except the last two years have been extremely wet. It was too wet to put stock in there, so we didn't graze. But um, we did uh, just recently, and in my opinion, certainly needed it in because the grass from those two good seasons, it was a, a massive sward of um, uh, grasses and, and everything that it was sort of becoming, I dare say, moribund and then the, the species beneath those couldn't get to the sunlight and, and grow. So uh, the, we used the grazing to as a tool to, to take out that huge swath of, of, of dry grass there that it had all gone to seed. So it, it completed its cycle and, and now it's let, allowing the, the fresh regrowth of everything else there and some recruitment of new species as well. Great. Thanks, Cole. And um, just, yeah, just quietly, uh, Bev and Glenn, I know you guys are there. You, 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 please get involved in the discussion if and when you, you feel <laughs> free. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, look, I, I'm just going to go to a question that we've got here because I thought that I think that's quite relevant to what you're just talking about, Colin. So can grazing be done to decrease biomass after a big spring and summer growth period. So i.e. during spring and summer when native grasses are growing and flowering. Is that something that, um, is there a special clause or is it something that, you know, is it a sort of hard and fast rule there? Um, it's, it's as and when it's either required or when, it, when it's um, uh, um, suitable, I guess, um, because our seasons are so variable now that, um, you know, we, sometimes we might not get a, a summer grade because we haven't had the rainfall and vice versa with the winter. It just depends on the season and when, how much regrowth we get and uh, try not to impact on when the, the uh, species are trying to set seed. We'll go in after that when they've set seed and, and take out that swath of dry matter and, and allow the recruitment to continue. Okay, great. Thank you. And I, I just wanted to, I've got another image up here um, showing some regen which is obviously fantastic to see, and this looks in really good, really good nick in this in this area. I um I was wondering about sort of just protection of those sort of saplings and other small. And in the video, we saw awesome um, pit images of the wattle, and I've got a few more of um, native species that are doing really, really well in in that grazing area. Is it something that you need to be mindful of? Um, when the cattle are in there to sort of stop them from browsing or trampling on any region, or do you find that it's, it sorts itself out kind of thing? Um, it's certainly very mindful of it, and 
it's all to do with the the time that they're they're in there and, and possibly that then there was some uh damage i guess to, to some of those regen species but um you know in possibly in hindsight they may have been in there a day or a half a day too long um but yeah certainly um yeah mindful that that uh, they can do damage to them and, and uh, it's just part of the, the adaptive management we have to you know make sure that we'll do our best to, to minimize that impact on them and, and allow that to uh, to those species to survive and thrive could I just add in um, a, a comment to that as well? Um, in in the in the um, event where we do have um, regenerating species, especially the overstory species and midstory species that may have been suppressed through heavy grazing, um, if if we think that is going to be um, severely impacted through grazing, then we would implement a no grazing period. Um, for a number of years before we would allow grazing, um, in order to let those let those establish, and I think we we saw it when we were out there last week, Cole, that um, there there were the acacias. You know, they they were still in great nick. They had maybe had a bite here or there, but nothing that's going to that's going to stop those from um, or majorly impact those from their um, likelihood of of maturing, uh, in my opinion. Um, and yeah. So that, that's just a something on that. Great. Thanks. That's that's awesome. And I've got um, got a few more photos here. I think of Tom that Thomas took last week out there, which is great in this grazing area. So we've obviously got some bluegrass, a native um, pasture grass that is easily grazed. So it's um, grazing sensitive, I guess you'd say. Um, obviously the wattles, fantastic. Some nitrogen fix, uh, fixing benefits with them as well. Um, what are we looking at here, though? What's this one? So that's Altanenthia denticulata, um, okay. which is a I can't Don't swear at me. <laughs> <laughs> actually, in preparation for this, I I was trying to remember the common name for it, and I couldn't remember. Um, but it's uh, it's one of the many herbs um, herb species that are found on the property. Um, you, you you find this with um, the anadias and the um, a lot of people call crumb weeds. Um, and, and those smaller native forbs that uh, commonly occur in um, Gilgais and around other a little bit more wetter areas on, on the property. Um, and as a matter of fact, um, I actually found that when we were when we were there. So I did my EMM uh, maybe maybe uh, how long before the, the stock were in there, Cole? Maybe a month before. Um, yeah. I was out there doing the EMM, so I'd done all my floristic sampling then and then being back there two months later after the grazing. And I'd say, if anything, there was a lot of areas that had um, some minor soil disturbance from the stock moving through um, and the, um, as Cole said, uh, taking out a lot of that, um, the, the biomass of the, of the dead grass um, or the hay, the hay grass, um, creating a lot more uh, sunlight reaching through to the uh, to the ground, and I would say at least so the salt bushes, um, the anadias and the regodias, so um, berry salt bush, climbing salt bush, um, thorny sub, spiny salt bush. Um, a lot of those were actually in higher abundance following that graze in the areas that we were than when I than when I um, was there prior to it. And that was because of the amount of biomass that was there. So, um, you know, and, and if you had have asked me before I joined BCT, um, you know, when I was doing my <laughs> ecology training, um, you know, it was grazing wasn't looked at too <laughs> at, at, in all, in all times too lightly. Um, but I'd, I'd, I've seen it on the ground, and I've seen I've, it's um, it's it's been it's been good. It's there's been a positive impact ecologically for the for the site after the graze. I would I would say for sure. Great, thanks, Thomas. And look, I'm going to ask a question without notice. I'm going to go to Bev. I think we've had enough mansplaining so far. <laughs> um, and just ask Bev. I mean, what have you? How have you? You know, how have you found working with the BCT? And um, have you seen some positive? Uh, results or, you know, um, observations for biodiversity in those grazing areas? Yeah, we have. Um, I think because our mindset was already in the rotational grazing, um, we've 
probably been um, more aware of the responses, like even over the whole property, the response um, of the hoof action from the grazing, um, we tend to be more aware or take more notice of, um, you know, what the responses are. Yep. Yeah, great. Um, thanks. Thanks, Bev. Glenn, anything to add, mate? How are you going over there? You're pretty quiet. <laughs> Yeah, pretty quiet. I haven't had anything else to ask yet. Uh, all going well. Um, yeah, I, I agree though, Bev. Um, you can really see that that hoof activity, uh, trampling of that extra biomass, as well as taking out the top layer. And as Thomas said, I think the ecological advantage there uh, is quite visible on that side in particular. Um, you can see those orbs and herbs going back through. So yeah, really good to see. Fantastic. And I um I also what um piqued my interest of some of the photos that Thomas got out on site um, being great looking condition. Yep. Get the, get the light back on Thomas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, great looking veg with um, some, some kangaroos in them. And, um, and I think it, it's probably one of those things that uh, people would um, ask if we didn't follow it, follow it up or, or go through it is that idea of, of kangaroo management. Now I've seen, already some posts um, online questioning sort of great conservation grazing and how can you graze and, and then control kangaroos at the same time. So clearly there's some misconceptions around kangaroo management. So I reckon, Thomas, you might be in the best spot for us to talk us through our approach to kangaroo management, you know, when it does apply and, um, you know, what it means for grazing systems and, that manage and the management of, of total grazing pressure. We do have a question here, sorry, just quickly about what is total grazing pressure. So if we could just talk to that firstly, that'd be great. And then how, you know, how we use the, the kangaroo guidelines that we've got as well. Yeah, sure. So total grazing pressure um, is the, the total amount of of pressure on those on those ecosystems from everything from domestic stock to uh, feral herbivores uh, such as goats uh, and rabbits to native herbivores such as macropods and, and kangaroos. So, um, you know, w we we look at it we look at it in a in a um, context of total grazing pressure. A lot of a lot of what we've got um, because um, the reality is that that it is it is an an uh, all encompassing impact. Um, a lot of the time on on what we've got there, um, you know, keeping the structure, avoiding um, loss of biomass, which can lead to uh, erosion um, and things like that. So, so we do we do first of all look at it as a total grazing pressure um, context, and then um, you know from then we tease out um, you know what 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 role is uh, the you know. Um, stock grazing playing in that. Um, so we can see there um, we do have um, managing overabundant kangaroo guidelines. Um, I would also like to quickly point out before I go into this as well that all our guidelines we do um, we do um, constantly review um, as we're implementing them um, because like I said before there's no one shoe fits all. Um, in a, in a lot of cases, um, but we do have this this discrete guideline where um, where we where we go through. We pretty much look at. Um, sorry, I've just just got something up on my screen here. Sorry, um, you know, um, looking at the condition of the site um, as far as how it, how it uh, interacts with with grazing, um, because we have the healthy condition um, thresholds. Um, we don't get usually get a crossover of of real heavy detrimental kangaroo, um, you know, impacts on the site and uh, overlapping with grazing because the grazing stops, and and the the um, the stock is either taken out or is not put in um, at all when it gets to those threshold numbers, which is usually sixty percent, you know, or thereabouts. Um, ground cover, um, and then we would be taking taking stock out there, and then if we're seeing um, we're seeing the uh, pressure continue on those sites, and we see that ground cover and those conditions continuing to fall um, with the stock being excluded, 
then we will have a look at things like um, management of, of exotic um, herbivores. Um, and so we, we pretty much approach it of, well, take the stock out. How's it going? Still getting worse. All right. Can we step up our management of those other herbivores that are impacting? Yes or no? We do that. And then we see what, what's the impact then? That's why we've got these, you know, total grazing pressure exclusions and stuff like that. So what's, what's going on there? Have we been able to um, effectively control those? And we'd look at, we'd look at scats. We'd, you know, when we're getting to these points, we'd be looking at really probably stepping up our monitoring to seeing, okay, what is actually eating the grass out there? Um, and then when we get to that point, it'd be looking at, all right, well, what native species are there? Um, and um, if they are indeed the um, native species, um, and then it'd be looking at, well, uh, exclusion um, and deterring the kangaroos or other, other native species is our number one, that's what we want to do. Um, I'm an ecologist. We're, we all work at the BCT. We're, we're not in it to damage native wildlife in any way. Um, that's the last thing that we want to do. Um, so we we go through that um, that uh, um, management uh, you know ladder that we've got there, and then if we get all the way down to okay, we you know we might actually have to look at um, a, a cull or um, you know direct management of those kangaroo numbers. If we just can't keep them out, um, we can't deter them, and it is and they are just smashing down the um, down the biomass, then we we would have a look at that, but. The where that starts all the way down here and where we stopped grazing is a is a massive gap. They they do not overlap. So we're never in a point where we're looking at controlling kangaroos whilst we're grazing. That's just not doesn't happen because because of the systems that we've got in place. Um, yep. So that's a really important aspect of that. And then when we when we do that, you know, we 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 go about it, um, you know, in in the most ethical way uh, that we can. Great, mate. Thank you. And it, uh, yeah, look, that's a it's a big question, and and you've answered it really really well. So I appreciate that, Thomas, mate, because it's important that we get that sort of information across. All right, so my time says about 12 minutes to go, and I've got a stack of questions here, so I'm going to throw some at you hard and fast. Um, the first one I've got here it would be for Colin Bev, in that um, it's asking if increased grazing pressure, or is there increased grazing pressure on the rest of the farm, as you cannot graze the agreement area perhaps as much as you may otherwise? No, we've adjusted our stocking rates to try and match that. Um, and, and in saying that, if we may not get the the same amount of grazing in that conservation area as we might have otherwise, but we're getting the the financial reward to offset that. So there's no issue there at all. Okay, great. Because that yeah, and that was the other question of a question I've got here, which may seem like a tricky one. Would be why do the BCT provide payments to landholders when they are good good landholders like yourselves when they're doing what they would normally do anyway? Is that is that a valid question? Uh, Anyone? <laughs> Maybe a BCT question. It might be a BCT question. What about you, Glenn? Yeah, absolutely. Well, why not pay people to do the right thing? Looking at Colin Bev's uh, situation there, already doing that uh, style of grazing. However, as Cole mentioned last year, even though he had the ability to graze that area, he didn't because it was too wet. So that's a management decision over and above what the guidelines specify. So he's already looking at the ground, he's already looking at what's happening there and he's managing it for the future. So why not be paying these people who are doing the right thing and they're grazing management systems uh, and be able to, um, as long as we can monitor that and, and keep on top of that sort of things, um, yeah, definitely. You're not really paying them the same as what they would be doing if they were grazing there themselves. As Cole suggested, the, the monetary value was about half of the lease opportunity. So it doesn't quite equate. He's actually taken a bit of a hit to do this. However, he can see it for future ecological gains and goals, benefits, and also environmentally, so for biodiversity purposes. Yeah, great. So Thanks, mate. Good answer. Sorry, I thought there might have been something else. Um, excellent, mate. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, my personal opinion, conservation has to pay its way, and I'm glad that we do. 
um, you know, even if it is only a, a, a small amount or just an amount that can cover that sort of, yeah, reduced grazing potential for some of those, for some of those areas. Um, changing tack completely, I have a question here about fire. So what about fire? And isn't there still a role to play? And I guess I'm talking, we're talking ecological burns. Um, is there still a role for ecological burns in, in those grazing systems? Maybe Thomas? Yeah, or sure. anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Um, so, uh, yes, there is. Um, we do have um, we do have fire as a management action. That's a um, that's a optional, um, you know, uh, management action in our in our management agreements. Um, and I guess it's um, there's nothing that'll 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 stop us um, from being able to implement um, fire as a management tool. Um, Obviously, it is it is quite different um, than than grazing, and just the same way as grazing isn't suitable in every ecosystem, fire is also not suitable in every ecosystem. It depends on when the last fire was, if there has been a fire, um, what species are there? Are they obligate seeders? If we do have fire obligate seeders, which are species that can only um, seed following fire, then uh, for ecological reasons, we will we will look at that and then that may have the same impact as grazing or a similar impact. We might be, you know, achieving the same goals. Um, so those are, those are two things that, that can work together. Um, and it is, it is not a case of, well, instead of fire, we'll just graze. Yep. Okay, great. Thanks, mate. Um, got a few questions here. It's all very good. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for sending these through. Um, Sam asks, from a practical perspective, the grazing guidelines are hard to implement. Are there plans to update the guidelines, perhaps to allow longer grazing periods? Now, as I understand it, the grazing guidelines were actually updated not too long ago, but they actually looked at um, changing the the grazing period. And didn't they restrict it? Is that right? Do you know, Thomas or Glenn? No, I think it changed the grazing. Anyway, maybe that's one we can take on notice if, if no one has the answer. Um. <laughs> Oh, I was, I was wondering if Glenn Go was going to say that one. So, uh, yes, it has. Um, we have uh, reviewed them. Again, we, we obviously re review them fairly at all fairly regularly. Um, but, um, yep, so at the moment, um, I'm pretty sure, and I've only just <laughs> ran my eyes over them recently, um, is the, uh, yeah, four seven-day grazes a year, and then those are then restricted by um, – by the grazing windows, um, and that that's changed from an initial 90-day grazing window um, that was, uh, I think, usually that was implemented in winter. That was before um, I started at the BCT, so I haven't actually uh, have experience implementing that one. Um, but uh, it is, again, a case of a way of looking at management. So that yep. that's what guides it. And um, if if there is going to be an you know ecology if we've assessed that ecological impacts are going to be too great with something like a larger window with longer grazes that isn't really achieving the management outcomes that we are trying to achieve through implementation of grazing, um, and that's what would have would have guided that as well as um, you know we've got lots of experts here and we look at uh, up the most up to date research which always changes obviously, and yeah working with working with back best practice in, in, in government and academia and in the, you know, in the industry. Yep. Um, yeah. So like Colin Bev, uh, the grazing, uh, sorry, coming back to that question, the grazing guidelines are hard to implement. Have you, and you can be as honest as you like, have, have you found the grazing guidelines and then grazing sort of management under our agreement and the management plan hard to implement? Um, for us, or me personally anyway, that I didn't find it onerous at all in probably because we'd already had the the education several mm -hmm. years prior and for holistic management and holistic grazing management and, and we'd already been implementing that for a, a few years. So from that side of things, it was a case of um, a slight adjustment to what we were doing and in, in that we were probably more uh, strategic or targeted at various times of the year that we would enter the conservation area. But um, other than that, no, it's been quite good. Okay, great. I think, yeah, I think there's a role to play for us, particularly if, where we've got graziers that may not, um, I guess, be 
have that history of grazing the way you guys have to to educate. And I think, you know, as part of, and we talked about the Central West, the the, the, the tender that you were a part of, um, you know, there's workshops and the other educational um, pieces that we include hopefully can provide for for graziers to understand how to apply the, the guidelines. Yeah. Um, thanks, guys. Um, yeah, I think there was another one here about, is there, oh, okay, is it possible to update a management plan if grazing hasn't been included already? I think it is difficult, but... Um, Glenn or Thomas, perhaps, do you guys know if, if um, have you, are you aware of it? <laughs> Sound of <laughs> silence. Love it. Yeah. I'm not. Uh, Thomas, do you know, mate? Um, I haven't uh, been associated with any agreements that that's mm. come up. Um, uh, maybe that's one that we can take on notice. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure that with, with, um, with sites that are already established, if they're looking to um, implement a grazing regime, they would obviously have to, um, I guess, abide by the principles. So all of those those principles that you mentioned, Thomas, would would definitely apply, and it would something that it would be something that you would have to yeah, chat with the BCT about. I don't think it's like a definite no no, but you'd have to sort of, um, you know, jump over those hurdles to be able to to see it justified effectively. So you know, that's one of those ones where please. Contact the BCT. Contact your local rep if you if you you know you want more information on that. What have we got? Three minutes forty five. Um, okay, oh, Colin Bev, great one. How do you account for reduction in resale value when it comes time to sell the farm? Given that these agreements limit the potential uses of the land, did that come into your bid? I think it's I think it's a um, increase in value of your place. Um, because of what we're wanting to do with the whole of the place that I don't see it as a drawback at all. I think that there'll be lots of others in the future who wish they had or will be doing this anyway. Cole? Yeah, I totally agree. That's um, an enhancement to, our, to the farm to have, have this area established on there and, and uh, the history with that. Um, having said that, our, our bid was not in perpetuity so that if whoever's the custodians in the future decided that they wanted to take a different path, well, that's uh, that's their decision. But, um, you yeah, know, we're, we're happy with the bid that we put in and the direction we're taking. And I see it as, as a, uh, like it's, it's an enhancement to the overall operation of the whole farm. And, and it's, it's terrific to have that there. I think so it's as a, a huge value, in, and especially now that um, natural capital markets are opening up around the, the place that um, more and more people are looking for those those areas to invest in. And it's, um, yeah, I see it as a, part, a total plus. Hear, hear. Love it. That's great. And just I just want to give an opportunity to everybody. Any sort of final thoughts or anything? Um, I've got a whole, a whole lot more questions here. And, again, thank you, everybody, for tuning in and providing um, questions. And we will get back to you afterwards. Um, through a you know further correspondence follow up email as we tend to do with these webinars. Anything? Any final thoughts before we before we say goodbye? I would just say that if, if anyone's hesitating about it, um, I mean we certainly did, but and we weren't, we weren't sure of the what value the ecological value our property had until we had that assessment. Um, yeah, put throw your bid in and and get it assessed, and um, if it's good enough value and, and your bid's not uh, too over the top and, and they're looking for it, well, it'll most likely get over the line. So, yeah, you, you don't know if you don't have a go. Love it. You don't know if you don't have a go. I love it. I think that's the way to end here. It's fantastic. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, though information on those tenders that, you know, like the example for the Central West that Colin Bever involved in, all of those tenders, we have them periodically. They will be um, shown on the website and also emails and um, other correspondence goes out to those as part of our conservation community um, if you're in those areas that we're targeting. So, yeah, fantastic. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank well, thank you again thank you. for joining us. Um, again, please touch base if you have any further questions, and we'll endeavour to respond to all registered attendees with any questions or comments made in Slido. Thank you, Colin Bev. Thank you, 
Uh, Thomas, thank you, Glenn. It's, it was great. Thank you for traveling in. Thanks for letting us come onto your property. It was just great. Um, yeah, so tune in again, please. Uh, tune in again on Wednesday, the 16th of August, when we'll learn from expert ecologists on the importance of bringing biodiversity back to farm dams. We'll talk through aspects of dam enhancement, including access control, revegetation, and creation of aquatic habitat as a means to restore and enhance your farm dam for native wildlife. I'm looking forward to that one. I'll be in this chair again. And look, a shout out for our soon to be released conservation e-learning unit. This is one of my babies. Five modules are set to be released at the end of May and the remaining four are not too long thereafter. You can see the different modules on your screen there. They cover all bases of management on an agreement area, but also provide principles and frameworks that are relevant for conservation management in general. So you don't need to be an agreement holder to get plenty out of it. We'll email out a link to the unit when it becomes available, and we would love for you to provide feedback as we'll be continually updating these units. If you're watching this in the future, um, please um, touch base with us, have a look, and um, we'll get you involved in those units and have a look at those modules because there's so much great information in them. All right, that's it for me. You've heard enough of my voice. Thanks so much, guys. Enjoy your afternoon, and um, see you next time. Cheers.